Good morning. I have to use the microphone because people downstairs in the overflow and then we're also live streaming this now and so I want to introduce to you once again Gary Scott. For those of you who don't know Gary, I met him last year on a Jamaica mission trip and I sat under his ministry one hour every morning plus the messages that he preached in Jamaica and I immediately realized that God's grace was richly given to this man to communicate the word of God and I praise God for it. Gary has already done three sessions, two last night, one this morning of what I'm going to let him explain as cross theater and it is just beautiful to hear the word of God communicated through his servant Gary. So would you please come and continue to do that. It has uh, been a great delight uh, to be here this weekend and see some old friends, make some new friends. Uh, Pastor Bill sent me uh, a list. I asked if he'd send me uh, the list of all of you people so I could put you on my mailing list and get some money from you. But he just <laughs> gave me your name. He didn't give me your address. And uh, so I, I really appreciate that. I uh, actually have had a ministry of cross on the Mason-Dixon line. You know, I've served in the north of that, and the south of it, and the north of it, and the south of it. And uh, when uh, I actually grew up not far from here in the southern tier, in a little town called Appalachian, New York, uh, my granddad had a farm in Larraysville, uh, Pennsylvania. So uh, it's kind of good to be back home. And when I went first south to Georgia, uh, they were okay because I told them I came from the southern tier. And so they could live with that. And then when I come back home and I say, well, I live in North Georgia, you know, so I found a way, you know, you kind of balance those two things together. Uh, I want this morning, everything that we've been saying really is going to come to focus right here. And I want to do just a, a quick review. Some of you, this may be new to you, but others uh, have this. We, we've been kind of looking at cross theater and what we mean by theater is that God created this world as a theater of his glory. He created it as a stage that he's going to play out the most impressive drama ever staged. In fact, every good book, every good play is an echo of this storyline. And and we call it cross theater. Uh, I, I love the song that we uh, just sang about the cross has the final word. And I love that, except it's totally wrong. Uh, it doesn't have the final word. The resurrection has the final word. But the cross is at the center of it, and we call it, and that's no criticism of the song. That's a great song. We ought to focus on that. But we want to see the whole thing. So through four sessions, we're going all the way back before creation, eternity past. We don't even know how to describe it. And we're going to go to the new heavens and the new earth. Now, there are not many preachers that are going to go through the entire Bible in four messages. And uh, we can't quite cover everything, but I want you to get the flow of this. At the heart of cross theater is God, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit that are staging their love, God's love. And so we go all the way back before anything existed, before there was a star, before there was a bug, before there was a sunset. Uh, we go to the very beginning, and there was the Father and the Son and the Spirit. And how do we describe their love? That is love what? Co-mingled. It's the kind of thing we don't understand. This message is really going to open this up, hopefully, to you, because the Father has eternally been the Father, and He's eternally begotten a Son that He loves with a way we don't even know how to describe. That love is so real and intense, the Spirit of God proceeds eternally from that, and the Spirit of God is in fact the embodiment of God's love. And so this God determined that he's going to create a stage, a theater. The cross is going to be the very heart of it. It is the final word. That's where God is going to be glorified. And so when he creates this world, we call that love what? Love 
expressed. expressed. Here's where God is showing and sharing his love and creating people that have the capacity to understand it. Adam and Eve did what to that love? They spurned it. They held it in contempt. They were unfaithful to the God who created them. And you think, that's the end of love story. That's going to be the end of Cross Theater. No, it presents the backdrop. And so act one, God creates. Act two, what does God do? He promises. So we talk about love promised to Adam and Eve in Genesis 3.15, the seed of the woman, to Abraham in Genesis 12, to David in 2 Samuel 7, uh, Jeremiah 31, Ezekiel 36. We see it over and over. God keeps telling them somebody's coming. Somebody that's not going to fail the way Adam did, and the way Noah did, and the way Abraham did, the way David did, the way Moses, all of them failed along the way. They couldn't deliver the goods, but somebody's coming. It's the Messiah. All of the perspective of the Old Testament was waiting for the promise. In the Sunday school hour, we came to Act 3. Act 3 is love, what? Fulfilled. The promise God makes, he keeps. And we said, not by sending an angel or a video or a tweet, by sending himself, his own son comes into this world. And what does he do? He demonstrates the love of God in a way we don't even know how to put in words. And the heart of that is at the cross, where he becomes both the victim and he becomes the victor. It doesn't look like that. The three days that he's in that tomb, Peter says he goes to the spirits in prison and preaches to them. Now, if you want to have some fun, try to figure out what that passage is about. There are views all over the place. But we want to bring you to the point we've talked about the pre-incarnate glory. That's what Christ was like before he was incarnate. And then the humiliation. But out of the humiliation comes the exaltation. We've got to go back to the tomb, the empty tomb. You remember some uh, uh, ladies came, and they came not to check out the resurrection. You remember why they came? They came to finish the burial. They didn't have time to give them a proper burial, so they were coming to finish the job, and on the way there, you remember what they said? Uh, how are we going to get this stone rolled away? You know, my husband's out fishing. I don't know what he was doing. But anyhow, how are we going to get this stone pulled away? And they get there, and the stone's already moved. And they go in, and there are two men dressed in white, angels, standing there saying, why are you looking for the dead among the living? He's not here. You know, he's been raised. Now, let me tell you, they didn't roll the stone away to let him out. You know that? They rolled the stone away so they could get in to see that he's not there. Here are the bedclothes and the napkins by the head in a separate place to show you this is not like somebody came in and dragged the body out. Remember, they paid off the Roman soldiers to tell fake news. You know, and to tell them somebody came and stole the body while they sleep, and they paid them off so they wouldn't get in trouble. But here is where it all begins. Here is the exaltation of Christ. This really kind of fits under uh, the, the, the last act, but I, I want to tie these two things together. Jesus Christ raises from the dead. How do you begin to explain that? What was that like? The people that saw him die, they knew he was dead. There are those that have the swoon theory. You know, he was just swooned on the cross, and the, the cool tomb revived him. Let me tell you, Roman soldiers know how to crucify people. They don't miss. When they crucify you, you end up dead. Jesus was dead. His body was in the tomb. And all that happened in those three days, we don't know completely, but we know that that first Easter morning, the tomb was empty because he was raised. People came out of the tombs, you know, and appeared to people. That must have been a wild thing, wouldn't it? There's Uncle John over there. You know, hi, Uncle John, how you doing? Uh, they, they come out of the grave. And then he has some amazing encounters with his disciples. Aren't you glad you weren't Peter? Peter, do you love me? Yeah, I love you. Uh, Peter, do you love me? 
You remember three times that Peter said, I don't know this guy. I don't know who you're talking about. The last time was cursing. You think that's just a coincidence that he said, now Peter, three times do you love me? He had those interactions and then he goes to Galilee to be with them. Do you remember on the mount, only Luke records this in Luke and Acts, the ascension. What an amazing thing. They're standing there and a cloud takes him out and lifts him up out of their sight. And the angels are standing there saying, why are you gazing into heaven? This same one that's taken up is going to come back in the very same way. And Jesus goes into heaven. Now, this is one of the greatest parts of this account. Jesus goes into heaven to do what? We often go to the, the verse on the cross, a tetelestai, it is finished. Well, that part of it was, but what happens when he goes into heaven? You remember in the Old Testament when they took the blood from the goats and the calves, that they took the blood and then they took it into the holy place and sprinkled it, you know, on the, on the altar? What does Jesus have to do? Jesus has to go through the heavens, not to the altar here on earth, but to the one in heaven, and that's where this sacrifice is finished and he presents himself to the Father, and God says, done, D-U-N-N-N-N, -N -N -N. done, finished, complete. And what happens? When God accepts that, the resurrection is the vindication, and now as he presents that, what happens? He's seated on the throne of glory. We call that the session of Christ. You have the resurrection, and then you have the ascension, and then you have the session where he's seated with all authority. Remember, he told him that in Matthew 28, all authority is given to me in heaven and in earth. Go and make disciples. All authority is given to him. He said that in Philippians 2. He humbled himself to death, service, obedience, death of the cross, so that God might highly exalt him and give him the name that's above every name, that at the name of Jesus Christ, everyone would bow their knee. That's what's happening here. Now, he's seated on the throne. How is God going to stage his love at this point? He's going to do something we still don't understand completely. The Father and the Son. The great schism that took place between uh, uh, the Roman Church and the Eastern Orthodox was over the Philoque Clause. And that is, did the Spirit come from the Father only, or did it come through the Father and the Son? We're not going to sort out the Philoque Clause. They haven't been able to figure that out in the last thousand years. But what we do want you to see is the very first thing that Christ did was to send his spirit. And so on the day of Pentecost, that was a wild day, the tongues of fire, the rushing mighty wind. Now I want to pause here for a moment and kind of take you back throughout the scripture so that you see what it looks like when God's presence comes. God's presence is coming so that we can experience the richness and the depth of his love. That's always behind that. So you go back to Eden. You know, Adam and Eve walked with God in the cool of the day, a kind of relationship we want to get back to, but we're actually going to go beyond that. And then, you remember Jacob's ladder, the angels ascending and descending? God's presence was there. At Sinai, came down and rattled the whole mountain. You know, the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire. And then you have the tabernacle that they built. God dwelt right there on the mercy seat between the cherubim. And then David said, I'm going to build you a house, but it's his son Solomon that builds the temple. God comes down and you think, wow! can't get any better than this. God is actually here. But who got to go in and see him? One person. How often? Once a year. Only after he did what? Sacrifice for himself and the people. 
he went in. God was there, but you couldn't get to him because of sin. Because we'd go in there, uh, we wouldn't walk out alive given the majesty and the holiness of God. You say, that's amazing. But the Old Testament says, you know what? The virgin's going to conceive and bear a son. And you're going to call his name what? Emmanuel. Emmanuel is the Hebrew word that means God is with us. God's love now is going to be embodied in Jesus Christ. And do you remember how that was done? John 3 tells us the Spirit was given to him without measure. Now, go back over here. We said the Spirit is the embodiment of God's love. And God sends the Spirit fully in Jesus Christ in order that he might be able to stage God's love. And as he goes back to heaven, what does God do? What does the Father and Son do? They send the Spirit. And so it even gets better. Remember John uh, 16, 17, where it says, you're all upset that I'm going away. But he said, it's to your advantage that I'm going away. If I stay here, you're going to miss out on something really important. But if I go away, I'm going to send the Spirit. And he's going to come and convict the world of sin and righteousness and of judgment. He's going to teach you the things that you're not ready to hear right now. So what God is going to do is he's going to take his love and it's going to be a love dump. He's just going to pour that in your heart. That's what Paul says in Romans 5, that God poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Now, it's not just a sprinkle of that. We talked about the Reuben sandwiches. It's not just a whiff of that. No, it's the whole thing. He pours out the Spirit of God, and when the Spirit of God comes, what happens? The love that was secured for us at the cross, embodied in the Spirit, it's like, you know, somebody, uh, they, they need uh, chemo, they need some kind of uh, special medication, they put the port directly in, goes right to the heart. That's what God does. He puts a port in there, and he just pours out his love into our heart. That's what happens in the new birth. Why am I here? Why, you know, why do I love preaching the gospel? Why I've been in ministry? Because I was a good living, I, you know, I did, a, you know, I was okay. I'll tell you why. It's because when I was four years old, God poured out his spirit into my heart, transformed me, gave me a love that 65 years later, I've been a Christian 65 years, 66 years almost, and it gets better, and it gets better. Now, you can't say that about Netflix. You know, you can't say that about your new car. You can't say that about any of the stuff we have. It gets old. But what happens? God took this little sinner, this rebel against God, and he breathed. <sighs> what was the breath? It's the Spirit of God. Wind blows. You know, you don't know where it's coming from. You don't know where it's going. But you know it's there. And the Spirit comes. And what does He do? He pours out God's love. Boom! Right into your heart. You know, not a whiff, not just a trinkle, but the whole thing. And suddenly the things that you love are altogether different than they ever were before. Why? because God is staging his love. And he can only do that with the Spirit of God. Only the Spirit of God can turn the heart that loves himself in his sin into a heart that loves God. Now, if I'm clever enough, I can get you to be a fan of Jesus. You know, get the t-shirt, you know, get the cap, you know, clap, sing the songs, do all the rest of that. I can make you a fan. I've been a Yankees fan for a long time. Hope that doesn't get me in trouble here. But I'm the kind of fan, if they're winning, I might watch it once or twice during the year. If they're in a World Series, I'll watch it. But I, I, I'm a pretty pathetic fan. 
And you know what? That's the way most fans of Jesus are. If you're here and you're a fan of Jesus, you're missing out on this whole thing. It's pretty pathetic. But I tell you what, the Spirit of God makes disciples. And you know what he does? He pours into our heart God's love. Just think about that. How do I explain that? Well, it's because of what God's doing. Now, I want you to see this. This is the love, the Father, Son, and Spirit that they expressed at creation. And even though it was uh, spurned, he promised that he, he's going to send his son, and his son came and fulfilled that promise. And now he's going to take everything that Christ accomplished on that cross, and he's going to pour it into our heart. I had a real good friend in our church in Georgia. You never saw him without a cup of coffee. I told him one day, I'm going to get you an IV. You know, just have this thing, put it in your vein, go straight in, don't have to waste all the time going through the diet. Put it right in. Well, friends, that's what God's done through Jesus Christ and the power of his Spirit. If Jesus needed the Spirit, friends, we need the Spirit of God. So what does the Spirit do? Gives us a new heart, transforms us, gives us a new mind. Those that, that try to read this apart from this new birth, it doesn't make sense to them. 1 Corinthians 2 tells us that. But he does more than that. You know what he does? He gives gifts so that we can stage God's love to other people. Do you realize that? You know, I, I stand up here and share these things with you. It's not like, hey, you know, I, I got all this stuff. Let me tell you what I know. You know what that is? That's God's love. Remember what he said to Abraham? I want you, I'm going to bless you so that you can what? Hoard it? I'm going to bless you so you can be a blessing to other people. And so through the power of God's Spirit, I experience his love in my heart. And that love then rolls out so that I can tell you something about God's love. And you see how this kind of becomes a boomerang. It comes from God. It comes through my heart. It touches your heart. That in turn lifts your heart to God. You go out and share that with other people. Man, God has given you gifts and he's put you on unique stages. Now, we talk about the world being a stage. Have you ever gone to a Broadway play? And there might be six or seven different scenes. And one, they stage it in the country, another it's in the city. I, I remember seeing Music Man. I love Music Man. Uh, have you ever gone to see that and they're all sitting on the, uh, the trolley, you know, and they're bound, I mean, it looks like, it's still as can be, and it looks like they're bouncing. And then everyone moves forward when it comes to a stop and then they're bouncing again. And you see these different scenes. Well, let me tell you, friend, God's put you on a lot of different stages so that you'll be able to stage, to show God's love. He did that in your home. Isn't that an amazing stage? Just think of all the opportunities God's given you to love your husband when he's a grouch, you know, when he's insensitive. That's an opportunity for God's love to flow through you to him. When you go to work, you're on a stage out there. See, it's not just inside here. We looked at the passage in 1 Corinthians that where uh, Paul says that, that uh, 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 he made us apostles, you know, to be on the stage. Uh, theaters, we apostles are a theater to the world, to angels and to men. And he put us there so that we might display God's love. He gave you that opportunity at work when you go to work out at the gym. When you go to visit somebody in the hospital, when you go to mow a widow's lawn, do you realize every one of those are different stages on which you're playing out the same message? And that is, man, God's love has flowed into my heart in such a way that the only thing I know to do is just let it flow out so that God's love comes through you and flows into somebody else's life. And it may be the gift of administration, maybe the gift of helps, maybe the gift of teaching. There are all kinds of different gifts, and you need every one of them. If every one of you were a teacher, this church would be weak. 
you need a diversity of those gifts. Why did God do that? Because he loves us. So he's going to give us everything that we need. But get this. He doesn't just give us gifts. I, I love the part when Paul says, my preaching was in demonstration of the Spirit of God and of power. It wasn't rhetoric. It wasn't clever words. It wasn't cute stories. It was the power of the Spirit of God that took those words and make them come to life. And friends, preaching is like... Uh, we read about in Ezekiel preaching to the dead bones. Are they going to live? I don't know, Lord. And, uh, you know, they come together and skin and breath comes in them. That's what happens when preaching. I can't make anyone change their heart and mind. But somehow, God can use me to communicate his love so, bam, it impacts a person. I, I got a letter a couple of years ago from a gal that was converted in an Easter Sunday service 30 years ago. Never knew anything about it. She's a missionary now. She said, I just wanted to tell you, you may not know this. And you stand back and say, wow. You know, it's so easy to get discouraged because you don't see the results. You know, Pastor Bill, if you're in this because of the accolades that they put around you and the trophies they give you, you're not going to be here very long. We, we don't live for that. You know, we live for experience and the love that we can share with others. How does that come about? It's because God's going to make sure we're all slow learners. He's going to make sure he doesn't, we don't miss it. So you know what it does? He puts the Spirit right there. So the Spirit can get the job done. You pick up your Bible and say, I don't get what this is about. And suddenly, the Spirit turns on the light. I shared with somebody one of my favorite statements with Kevin Van Hooser, where he makes this point. He says, the Spirit speaks in, expressly in Scripture by rendering their illocutions in the sententional, generic, and canonic forms illocutionarily efficacious. Now, isn't that a great statement? And you know what he's saying? The Spirit of God that wrote this book, imagine you're doing a, you know, a, a book review of, uh, uh, of William Shakespeare, and old Bill shows up, not this Bill, but Bill William Shakespeare, he says, now this is what I mean in Macbeth. Wouldn't you love to have that? Well, that's exactly what God does, and he loves us enough to give us his word and then give us the one who's going to open our heart to see that and understand it. He's not going to leave it to our own. But you know what else he does? Brings the Spirit of God in our heart, and he produces fruit, doesn't he? You know, the works of the flesh, you know, strife, lust, pride, all the rest of the stuff. But the fruit of the Spirit is what? What's the first thing he says? Love. So I'm a loving person. Where did that come from? It comes from the fruit of the Spirit. Because the love that God has promised and fulfilled and expressed is embodied now by his Spirit. If you quench and grieve the Spirit of God in this fellowship, you can do all you want and you're not going any place because it takes the wind of the Spirit to catch the sails and move you forward. What is that all about? That's about God's love embodied. It's not good enough just to show it to you. He's going to take and he's going to put that, that uh, line in so it goes right into your heart. He's going to pour out his love into your heart so that you're nourished by that, but even more than that, so that you can bless others, you become a channel. I love what Peter says, we become administrators of the grace of God. Think of the guys with Social Security office, Social Service office, and you go there, you, you know what those uh, 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 U.S. employees often are like. I often said if I believed in purgatory having lived in Long Island, purgatory would be going to the DMV and getting in the same line day after day and being rejected by the form and going back and saying, no, you have the wrong thing, and then you go through it again and again and again. Isn't it a glorious thing? that God pours out his love into our heart so that it will nourish us, but so we can pass it on. And friends, listen to me. God's called you. You've got a mission here. It's to make disciples. 
It's to nurture. It's to care for one another. All the one anothering commands, what are they about? It's about love, God's love being embodied. You remember Galatians 6, if you which are spiritual, that is, those of you who have received the expression of God's love through a spirit, you who are spiritual, if you see somebody tripped up, what do you do? Well, you whisper about them. You go to a prayer meeting and say, I want you to pray for such and such. Now, what does it say? You're to go wrap yourself around him so that that brother in his brokenness will feel God's love. That's what, that's what this is all about. He's put us here so that we would embody that love. And it would come out in every part of our life. Whether when you're gathered together, this is a stage. When you're at home, when you're at work, wherever you go, here is an opportunity to take God's love and channel that to somebody else. Friends, I want to tell you, if you do that, you know, by, by God's grace and for his glory, you'll have to build another building a couple of years down the road after you get this one finished. I understand it's going up in the next year or so. Because people are not looking for some kind of religious stuff. You know what people want? They want to know and they want to experience. They want to taste God's love. And you can't get that by watching the video. You get that with real people. Let me tell you one of the concerns that I have. You know what's happened in our day? We've gone to the social media, and we feel like I'm blessing people. I've got 1,400 friends on Facebook. <coughs> and you know what? There's something altogether different. Uh, uh, the apostles never said, you know, friend people on Facebook. Remember what he said? Greet one another with what? A holy kiss. Now, I'm praying for you guys because I ain't got a holy kiss the whole time I've been here. <laughs> and let me tell you something. You know, we kind of chuckle at that. But the point is, God didn't make us spirits floating around. He made us embodied spirits. There's something about touching another person. I remember when we had a Christian school, I'd come in in the morning and I'd put my hand on one guy, you know, one boy's shoulder and I'd pull one of the girl's pigtails and, you know, just speaking to them and touching them. That's a way that we show God's love, that, that, that the love that comes to us and just think about how it had to get there, all the things that we got through in order for the Spirit of God to pour this in my heart. Is it a coincidence? That first John starts out, love one another because love is from God. The whole point of first John 4, go back and read it when you have time to let it soak in. Every relationship, every encounter is a stage where you can embody God's love, where you can show God's love to people. And friends, when we stand before God, one of the things he's going to want to know, or he already knows it, but he's going to expose it, is the consistency of the love for God that you showed and you shared with the people around you. Now, I want you to hear this statement. If you want people to hear about God's love, tell them. God loves you, has a wonderful plan for your life. Lots of people have heard that. If you want people to understand God's love, then you teach them. You do a series on love and tell them what that's like. If you want them to feel it, tell them a story. Stories are the way that we communicate. They're stories that you've heard that touch you in a profound way. But if you want it to be embodied, you got to put them on stage. They got to stand up there and say something and do something that communicates the love of God. And here's my challenge to you. I don't want you just talking about this. I don't want you just checking it off and say, I believe that. I want to tell you, it's got to be embodied. And it can't be apart from the Spirit of God. And whenever you see the love of God being embodied, you see God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit that are behind all of this. Now, friends, it seems like we go through this, I can never do that. Yes, you can, because God, through His Spirit, will enable you to do that. 
let's say I have a 50 pound chunk of metal right here and I'm holding it, well let's go to 20 pounds, I'm holding this 20 pound piece of metal up. If I drop it, where is it going? Is it going to fly up or is it going to drop down? No, it's going to go right straight up. Because what you don't know is I've got a huge electromagnet up there that will pull 2,000 pounds, so when I let go, it's going to go right up. Now, is gravity stopped? No, gravity's still working, but that's stronger than gravity. Are you a sinner and messed up? Listen, we need to get past the place where we're pretending that we're all fine. We're good people. No, you're not. You're all a mess. I'm a mess. Let's start there and say we're all a mess. And so that, that old sin nature is constantly pulling us down. But what did God do? He put an electromagnet there that overrides that. When I was a kid, not every car had a radio. You know, uh, it wasn't a rich man's car if you had a radio, but not all cars had radios. The rich people, they not only had a radio, they had an FM radio. Well, I wasn't rich, and I had a car that had a radio, but it didn't have FM. These guys would talk to me about all the things they're listening to on the radio. I said, nah, it's not there. I go back and forth, can't get it. Well, one day I got some money and I got an FM converter. I mean, I was something now. You know, plugged it in and suddenly a whole new world was created that second. Uh-uh, been there all along. But now I can connect with it. Now I have a receiver that can get it. And I tell you, people who don't have the Spirit of God, you know, it's like listening to AM all the time. There's a whole FM station out there that has a whole lot better stuff, and you're missing it. And that's why we began with the shattered dreams. If you're building your life on a wish dream, it's going to crash. But if you build it on the hope of Cross Theater, it's going to continue forever and ever and ever. And that brings us, and I, I wish we had more time to stretch this out, because this gets to the best part. You know, the farther along you go, say, well, it can't get any better than this. You know, he's poured out his spirit. But isn't life messy and discouraging? How many of you can say, and I was born 65 years ago, and I've lived happily ever after. Remember all the stories I read when I was a kid, they didn't say, there's a lot of trouble ahead. You know, it's kind of like the, you go to the, the Chinese restaurant and you get a, you know, one of the, the fortune cookies. Have you ever got one of those that says you're going to fall and break your leg tomorrow? I mean, it's always, you know, you're going to meet a friend, you're going to come into a lot, it's always this good stuff. Well, the reality is, life is hard. There's a battle, there's a spiritual battle. We've been talking about what God's doing. I actually did a 16-part series in Texas for some missionary on spiritual warfare and how Cross Theater fits into all of that. But let me tell you, it doesn't end with love embodied. Because Act 5, Act 1 is love expressed, Act 2, love promised, Act 3, love fulfilled, Act 4, love embodied when God pours out His Spirit, but then we come to the honeymoon where love is consummated, where everything that God's doing, it's going to come to its crescendo. And so, as we read the Scripture, just as in the Old Testament, the promise, they kept looking forward to the coming of the Messiah. So where are we right now? The Messiah already came. We're waiting for Him to come back. And whether you look at 2 Peter or 1 Thessalonians 4 and 5, or whether you look at the book of the Revelation of Jesus Christ, these are not passages to help you win the millennial debate. You know, one of the problems has been we've gone to this and saying, okay, are you pre mill? Are you post mill? Are you a mill? You know, are you pan mill? You know who the pan mills are. There are the people who say, I don't know, but it's all going to pan out in the end. And then there are the windmills. You know who they are? They're the people that blow from one position to another depending on the last conference or the last book they've read. You know, and then you've got the pre-trib and the post-trib and the mid-trib and the partial trib and you know, you say, wait a minute, I don't even know the language. Is that what Revelation is about? You know, so it's a tool that we beat the ah mills down or the post mills or the dispensational pre-mills or pre-trib. Is that what it's all about? 
You know what it's all about? It's getting us ready for the end and telling us, I love the passage in Titus, the blessed hope. What's the blessed hope? Beam me up, Scotty. I'm getting out of here. The blessed hope is not getting out of here. What's the blessed hope? The manifestation of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's not about getting out. It's about Jesus coming down and finished what he started. He's not just going to save people. He's going to redeem this earth. Remember Romans 12? You know, the whole earth is groaning under the weight of this, waiting for the adoption. So we know there's a day coming that everything that's ugly is going to be undone. And everything that we've always wanted, the things that we've been waiting for. So as we go through the scripture, as we come to that, we go through an ugly tribulation time. Friends, there are people going through some ugly things around the world right now. You know, and you understand what they go through. Their, their farms are destroyed. Their children are sold into slavery. They themselves are killed all around the world. You know, we tend to think, well, get me out of here because I don't want to suffer when brothers and sisters around the world are suffering every day. One of the ways we show the love of God is to unite, to, to connect with them, to pray for them, to support them in the midst of this. But friends, listen, we're all going through it. And it's going to be a time we don't even know how to describe. And, and my purpose this morning is not to get into all the details. I just want you to see the big picture, the end, whether it's pre-trib, post-trib, mid-trib, partial trip, there's a terrible time coming. And that is a time to test and separate because Jesus is going to come back and we're going to reign with him. And there's going to be this time of, of, of peace. And then Satan is going to be let loose and there's going to be a big battle at the end. And let me tell you what, it's not going to be a big fight because the one that's riding on the white horse is just going to simply say, enough. Enough said. There was, a, there was a, uh, an umpire. This was in the early 1900s. He got knocked out by one of the pitches. So there was a guy there named McGurvey that was a professional boxer. And they said, listen, would you come and call strikes for us, strikes and balls? And sure, I'll, okay, I'll do that. Never done it, but I'll do my best. So we got up there about the third batter up. He called strike three. And he started arguing with McGurvey. And McGurvey says, no, that was a strike. No, that wasn't a strike. Yeah, that was a strike. And he said, enough said. And he kept arguing. Poop, one punch knocked him out cold. He went on to be a regular umpire. They called him enough said McGurvey. And when he said, enough said, you said, okay, I'll leave it there. You know, I don't want to, uh, you know, get the fist in the end of his nose. Well, listen, that's the way it's going to be. Jesus Christ is going to say, enough said. It's done. And this uh, uh, a parody of the Trinity, the beast and the false prop, and Satan himself, they're going to be removed. And then what happens? We go through Revelation 20. We stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And you know what he's going to be weighing? How well did you stage God's love? The love that I poured into your heart by the Spirit, how freely did that flow out to everyone else? And you know the story, the sheep and the goats, the right and the left, and, and that is going to be a sobering time. But then something happens that we can't even begin to imagine. All of those things are washed away. And then what happens? Heaven comes down. And there's a new heaven and a new earth. And somehow it's merged together. I want to read just a few of these verses from Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 21. Listen to this. We talk about the consummation, everything that has been promised and fulfilled, it's going to come to its consummation. There's going to be a wedding party. There's going to be a celebration. There's going to be time of glory. We don't know how to put in words. Here's what it looks like. I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. There was no longer any sea. 
I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. What's that all about? Remember when Jesus said, all the Father has given me will come to me? That's the bride. There's going to be a wedding. There's going to be a celebration. We are going to celebrate in a way we don't know how to describe. I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, now what? The dwelling of God is with man. Now God's love is going to come to us in a freshness and a directness and a richness that some have called it the beatific vision. We don't even know what it's like. But it's going to be better than anything you've ever experienced here. That's our hope. This is not a dream or a wish. We know God said this is what's going to happen. Uh, the dwelling of God is with men and he'll live with them. He was there in the tabernacle, but there was a veil. You couldn't get there. But now all of that is removed. A new and living way in the sacrifice of Christ has been opened. But right here, what's happening? God himself is coming down to dwell with us. So the love that characterized the Father and the Son and the Spirit from all eternity is now going to be poured out. It is just going to run freely. You remember the wedding at Cana? They served the wine, ran out of wine. Jesus made new wine. And he said, listen, everybody serves the best first. And when you get a little tipsy, you know, they didn't bring out the bad stuff. He said, you save the best to the end. Friends, that's what God is doing. He's got something in store for you that's so beyond your ability to conceive. I don't know where to begin. You know, he said the sufferings of the present age are not worth comparing to the, the, the glory that's going to be ours. So here he is. The dwelling of God is with men. He will live with them. They will be his people. And God himself will be with them and be their God. That's the theme throughout. I'm your God. You're my people. See the relationship? That's what God's love looks like. It's not a cheap love that says I love you and then ignores you can't tell you the number of counseling situations that I've had. Remember one guy, uh, a couple came in and the wife said, I said, what's the trouble? You know, I try to get them to articulate that. Well, my husband doesn't love me anymore. And he said, June, he said, 34 years ago when I married you, I told you I loved you. If that changes, I'll let you know. Now, how do you like to be married to that kind of a guy? God's love isn't like that. I told you three millennia ago, he keeps showing it again and again and again and at this point he's going to be right there and we're going to be able to see him and we're going to enjoy that what's he going to do every tear he's going to wipe from your eyes if you could put some solution in a bottle that would relieve people's fears and pains and doubts you'd be a billionaire instantly we can't do that, but he's going to do that. There'll be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne. Got to go back to four and five. The one seated on the throne. I. I'm making everything new. This love story that I've been you know, going through and staging it, it's going to come to its fruition. Friends, let me tell you, we, we talk about a couple, they uh, fall in love, they go through an engagement period, they get married, and that consummation of that marriage is a beautiful picture of exactly what this like, but it's just a faint echo. As glorious as the blessing of marriage is, that's just an echo. This is the reality. That's why we're not going to be sad that we, you know, I've had some people say my favorite verse is, you know, they don't marry in heaven. I finally get rid of my husband, my wife that's a loser. That's not what it's all about. It's about God's love will be so rich that any relationship with someone else would simply be a parody of that. That's what God has in store for you. His love will be consummated. The sadness, the pain, the tears, the suffering, all of that is gone. 
And then he gives us a picture you know, of, of, of heaven itself with the pearly gates and, and all of these precious stones. You, you may have heard the story of this rich guy that got converted late in life. And he went to his pastor and said, you know, I hate to leave it all behind. You think I can take some of it with me? And the pastor said, well, I don't think so. But he said, you know, I'll pray about that. Well, he gets a vision that this guy can take one suitcase with him. So the guy dies, and he takes a suitcase with him. And Peter says, uh, uh, no carry-ons. You know, you, you can't bring anything with you. And he said, no, I, I got special permission to bring this. And he goes back and checks and says, well, yeah, you're right. He said, but, you know, I got to check it. You know, I got to inspect your bag to see what's in it. He opens it up, and it's solid gold bars. And Peter looked at him and said, and you brought pavement? <laughs> All the stuff that matters so much here, that's going to be what heaven, that's the roads are going to be made of. We're going to walk them. That's not what it's going to be about. It's not all the stuff that you get. We've got so much stuff, you know, that we waste so much money cleaning it, you know, protecting it, uh, you know, uh, all the stuff that goes around, all that stuff is going to be gone. And you know what's going to be there? It's going to be the love of God. And it's going to be the people that the love of God touched their heart, that you're going to share that with them. And that's what it's going to be like. And there is the tree on either side of the river that flows out from the throne. How do you describe that? Have you ever seen a tree that's on both sides of the river? But that's what we have. And there's going to be fruit every month. And here is the life, the love that's flowing out from God. We're going to feed on that. And every day is going to get better and better and better. C.S. Lewis expressed this so well in the Chronicles of Narnia. As they're going into heaven, they go from down here into this high place, and it's absolutely amazing. They say, wow. He said, no, higher up and farther in, you're not even there yet. So they go up to the next one and say, wow, oh, this is amazing. Oh, no, higher up and farther in. You're just getting started. Friends, listen to me. We don't even know how to put in words what this is going to be like, that everything that we always have been waiting for is going to be there and more. And what's going to be at the heart of it? It's God dwelling with us. Why? So he can watch us and see if we do anything wrong? No, that's all past. So that the love, the love that he shared with the Father and Son and the Spirit, the love that he expressed in creation, the love that he promised to Abraham, the love that he fulfilled in sending his Son, the love that he embodied in his Spirit, it's going to come to consummation. There's going to be a day, and those of you that sing like a frog are going to sing like an angel in that day. And there's going to be a celebration. Do you know people around you that don't know this? Wouldn't this be a good thing to tell them? Wouldn't it be a good thing to take this and say, hey, listen, let me tell you something. Man, this is the best story I've ever... People do that with movies. They say, oh, you got to see this movie. A great t you know, TV program. Oh, this was great. You've got to watch this. Well, friends, we got something better. We got Cross Theater. Because Cross Theater is where God stages His love. And we get to be part of that. We get to be the recipients of that. But we also get to be the dispensers of that. So others will be the recipients of that. And when it all comes back, you know what we're going to do? We're going to take all the love that we've enjoyed, and we're going to present that as a gift to God. Augustine said, our hearts are restless until we find our rest in him. I want to conclude and say, our hearts are loveless until we find our love in him. And when we get it, it changes not just the way we think, and what we affirm, it changes what we do with our hands and our feet and our eyes and our ears. God's given you an opportunity to be a channel, to be an administrator of his love. Don't miss that. You know, don't end your life saying, you know, the dream that I dreamed is crashed, it's shattered. There's an enduring hope. 
That enduring hope is cross theater. It's where God stages his love. Let's pray together. Father, we stand before you this morning unable to know what to say as we see this whole picture unfold. And Father, we realize we haven't even begun to do justice to the beauty and to the richness and to the glory of all of this. And Father, I, I pray that uh, this time that we've had together will just plant some seeds that will grow fruit in the lives of each one of these men and women and young people and children that they will begin to recognize the expressions of your love all around them. Whether it's healing that they prayed for, whether it's a gift that they give to a brother that's in need, whether it's a word of encouragement to someone that's distressed, whether it's a, an orphan and a widow that we walk alongside and help them. Father, would, would you get us away from uh, this whole concept of the world, of the quid pro quo, that we're going to give something to somebody because they think we'll get something better back. Father, will you enable us to see that you give freely with no strings attached because the Father, the Son, and the Spirit love in a way that we'll never fully comprehend. So Lord, I pray for your people that are here. Father, would you put at least a longing in their heart to taste this love, to experience it, and to be able to share it. And Father, if there's anyone here today that doesn't know this story, they're not part of this drama. Father, would you open their heart to recognize that the center of all of this is the cross. It's where Jesus became the victim and he became the victor. And now he's seated King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And he's coming back one day so that this story of love will come to a glorious consummation where each day will be better than the one before. Father, we're so grateful that we have a hope that will never be tarnished. So Father, we ask that you would refresh our hearts, plant that in our hearts. If there are those here without Christ, open their heart to be part of this cast, that they would be called by you and, and placed in the role that you want them to play. And so we commit ourselves to you. And Father, we want to do exactly what Paul said, not to be conformed to this world, but to be transformed by the renewing of our minds that we might prove what your will is, that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.